to get you up, for the people who are just joining for this session, um, what you need to know at the first session is that it was brilliant. I handled all the questions with, with complete correctness and with no hesitation. That's what you need to know. Um, what else do we need to know? Um, so what we've been talking about right now is object lifetimes. And if we, is the camera on? The red light's blinking. It's red. All right. So what we've been talking about is object lifetimes and when the destructor attaches. Uh, so in other words, when an object actually begins to live, and what what cleanup we're responsible for if a destructor throws. Uh, I mean, excuse me. If a constructor throws uh, in the body of the constructor. And I wanted to tell a little story, and the reason I like telling the story is because, first of all, it illustrates uh, an interesting quirk in C++, and secondly, in the version that I tell, I come out to be the hero. So, of course, I love to tell this story. Uh, but it, it goes back to a, a previous employer I had. We were working on this big project, very, so big, that we had some people from another team were assigned to help us. And so one of the guys, a really smart guy, uh, from the other team, we've given him some requirements, and he designed this object. He said, this is going to solve your problems. And I looked at the API, and, and it, was, it was right. It was doing everything. But I said, well, there's one thing, though. After I construct your object, I have to call this other method, which does this initialization stuff. And why can't we just put that in the constructor so I just construct it? And he said, well, um, I like to report errors with exceptions. <laughs> And I said, I like that. Join the club. What's the problem? And he said, well, you can't throw from the constructor. And I said, why not? And he said, well, you'll leak the memory of the object. And I said, no. And he said, oh, well, we've tested. I've tried it. it. It leaks. And I said, if that were true, that would be the compiler's number one bug. Everybody would be screaming about that. I mean, that's, that just can't be. If throwing from a constructor leaked the object, then you wouldn't be able to throw from a constructor. How else can you report errors from a constructor? I mean, it's, it's got to be that way. And he said, well, we know this is the case. We have this elaborate leak checking function, and we certainly did. And um, so he said, um, if we throw um, from, uh, from a constructor, we will leak the object's memory. And I said, well, that just can't be. I said, you know, we could write a test, a dummy little test app that doesn't include the leak detection that you have. And I said, you know, there's probably a bug in there. It's probably reporting something that's not really true or something like that. Make a, you know, a simple little app that does nothing except create this object that's really large and leak and throw in this constructor and do this in a loop. And then watch and see if it starts taking up more memory. I didn't actually do this because I mentioned we were on a big project. But he did. He didn't tell me that he did. He didn't tell me the result. But the result he found out that, no, it doesn't be. So it was over a year later. One of the coworkers on my team was assigned a bug. And what the problem was is that one of our uh, tests, automated tests for Japanese, was failing. And the way it was failing is it was doing this memory loop. And we had this leak checking. As I mentioned, this sophisticated leak checking system, which is detecting leak. So he did a lot of investigation, and he found out, oh, in the test, one of the things we do is we create this object, but it doesn't actually get created. It throws in the constructor, and it leaks the object memory. Wow. That's interesting. That's what I heard earlier. But it can't be true. But here it is. So I started to look at it. I said, well, the first thing I'm going to look at is what's our leak detection system? Well, our leak detection system used, this, used something called placement new. <laughs> so placement new, let's talk about placement new. So placement new is actually a term in the standard, which means any parameters that you pass to new that, um, that, that you pass the new operator, right? Anything here is called placement new. And the term comes from what the standard has as the original placement new. And in the original placement new, you pass the address of something. And so instead of allocating a heap version of object, it, it creates a new object. It calls its constructor and everything but it does it at this location. I can't help but think that is just so C++. Most object-oriented languages allow you to construct an object any place you want it, as long as you want it on the heap. <laughs> C++ lets you construct an object on the heap 
or on the stack, or any bloody place you want to put it. That's just so C++. So anyway, the term placement new comes because you can place it in a specific place. However, placement can be misleading because the truth is you can pass any set of parameters here and it's technically called placement new. So in our elaborate leak checking system that my company had, what they did was they had a macro new, capital N-E-W, and what it did was it called new, but it passed in the location, meaning both the file and the line number, of where the new was being invoked. That's why it had to be a macro, right? And the reason was, if, memory, if we found any leaked blocks, we could go and figure out where the allocation was coming from, and that doesn't solve your leak, but that's an important clue as to what might be leaking and why. So that was what was going on. And so I started looking at placement new to see if they had written that clumsily and that the leak checking didn't work. And it looked like placement new worked. But it just so happens that Scott Meyer's third edition of the uh, um, of his effective C++ <coughs> had just come out. And he actually he added in this edition, he added a new item 52. And it says, write placement delete if you write placement new. <laughs> and he had an explanation for why that is. And what he said is, whenever you call uh, the new operator, it's responsible for for reclaiming the memory of an object if you throw in disruption. So if you call new and it, it allocates this thing on the heap, and then it starts base classes and data members as we were talking about in the last session, and then it in the body of the constructor, if it throws, then new is going to allow the throw to go, but it's going to clean up the memory. The problem is, if you're calling placement new, it doesn't know where the memory is coming from, right? If you call placement new, it's automatically putting it in place. So any, any placement new you call, it's up to you to know how to destroy the object. In some cases, the right thing to do is just call delete. So for us, our implementation, which was logging where new allocations were happening by, by writing out the file name and the code number, or the line number, we would turn around and call the regular new. So calling delete was the right thing to clean up the memory. But the compiler doesn't know this. And so when you call placement new, if that fails, there's no way to know what's the proper way to clean up the memory. So the standard says that what we will do is we will create a placement delete. So there's no way to call placement delete. Unlike new, where you can pass parameters, you can't say delete, and by the way, here's some extra parameters, and then here's the object one. No, it doesn't work there. Delete just deletes. And there's no thing. There's no way to call placement delete. However, the compiler, if you call placement new, and the object were to throw in its constructor, will call the matching placement delete. In other words, it has the same number and types of parameters as the new, that way, if you need to do something to reclaim memory, you can do that. And that, of course, explains exactly what was happening to us. We had written our own placement new, and we call new, and then the object throws from the constructor, and everything gets cleaned up, except that the, uh, the compiler doesn't have a placement delete, because we've never written placement delete, to call to clean up the new that we had called. So, we, so I told my coworker who was responsible for fixing the bug, I said, here's the deal. We just need to write a placement delete, just take these same parameters. They're not actually going to pass you any meaningful data, just ignore the parameters. That's just to find the right function. And inside there, just call delete. Everything's good. And I said, by the way, you should call the guys on the other team who actually own the memory lake tracking system and let them know about this change you're making and, and what the deal is. So he fixes it, tests it, everything's working. Now. Nothing leaks, it's great. So, he calls for a code review in the other team, and they look at it, the guy who's responsible, he looks at it, and he says, yeah, that looks, that looks good, that looks good, but you should add an assert. And my coworker said, why are we adding an assert? He says, well, because this will only happen if someone throws from the constructor, and we shouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, placement delete will leak if you do. Uh, the error, this is what I think, the standard says it's not an error if there's no placement delete. I say, no, it's not an error, it's just a really hard to find one. I think the standard should make you provide placement delete and should give you an error. Well, okay. um, that depends. <laughs> what if you're using new, 
but there's no resource to clean up. Then you would have an empty function to let us know that that's what you meant. I think that... Now that's not in the spirit of the lazy C++ program. <laughs> Um, well, perhaps what you can do is when you declare your new, you can say equal delete, which means I'm really deleting the, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about RAA. That stands for Resource Acquisition is Initialization. And Yarny's the first person to tell you that that doesn't really just roll off the tongue. It's maybe not the best acronym to come up with, but I kind of like it for a couple of reasons, and that is, uh, well, okay, only for one reason. Um, it, you can look at it kind of backwards or forwards, because is is such a nice equal sign. You can say, if I want to acquire a, a resource, the way I do it is to create an object, initialize an object that acquires the resource. Work. And the flip side of that is, if I have some object that I'm going to make that needs some resource, then if I initialize the object, it gets the resource. So we'll talk a little bit about what exactly we mean. But I want to give you just some examples, and really, uh, this is kind of lame. The examples are just all over. There's all sorts of RAI uh, uh, objects in the, in the standard. Uh, I even wrote one here, but again, it's, it's kind of lame and useless. The only thing that you need to know is that uh, inside the constructor, we are doing, we're getting some kind of um, uh, resource, and then in the destructor, we clean that. And uh, just to make sure I don't allow it to be copied. Uh, most of you guys are up on this sort of thing. So here's, here's my question. What happens to the object if acquisition fails? Its lifetime will never begin. Uh, somebody else said what you just said, which is nothing. <laughs> nothing happens. Why? Because if you throw when you don't have the acquisition, then the object's lifetime didn't begin. Right? And what this means is that we have converted a, a runtime error of not being able to get an object into an exception. If we have the object, we have the resource. And if for some reason we couldn't get the resource, we have an exception, we don't have the object. So, um, uh, you know, the, the idea is that the destructors have the, the responsibility of doing it. Now, you may have a release member so that by the time the destructor is called, there's nothing actually to be done, but the responsibility is here. Remember what we said earlier, cleanup cannot throw. Destructors cannot throw. This is a fundamental requirement of being able to write exception safe. Um, so I want to talk about this kind of general design guideline, which is true for C++ and true for lots of things. Functions, types, whatever. Everything should do one thing. This is one of my, uh, I'm being self-critical here, this is my problem. I, I make an object and it's great, and then I add another thing, and I add another thing, and pretty soon uh, what I have is something here, which, you know, it's not a good knife, and it's certainly not good scissors, and the, and the uh, screwdriver's always broken. Uh, no, one thing, one thing. So, um, no object should manage more than one reason. When I mentioned this to Howard, he said, wait a minute, I write containers all the time and manage all sorts of resources. Okay. So for containers, it's different. But for a resource managing object, let's just make it one to one, and then uh, we're in good shape. So, um, so we've convert every resource is an object, and we need to make certain that every time we get a resource, it's going to be in an object, it's going to be, uh, it's going to have a cleanup in its destructor, and it's going to be on the stack, right? So, Smart pointers are your friend. Shared pointer, of course, most famous smart pointer in the entire world comes from us. Uh, it was in the TR1, it's now the standard. It's ref counted and it supports custom deleters, which is really cool because there's all sorts of cool abuses you can do to make it a RAI object for things other than it's intended to be. So somebody asked this question earlier, and this actually comes from Herb Sutter's Guru of the Week. Suppose you have some function, and this, uh, this function is written by somebody who wants to be really safe and make sure things don't leak, so he's taking his parameters by, uh, by smart pointer. Is this safe? Let me give you a tip, by the way. If somebody has a slide that says, gotcha, <laughs> and then they say, is this safe? What's the answer? No, no. Okay, so this is not safe. Why is it not safe? Oh, now it gets interesting. Why is it not safe? Because the compiler can do a both of the allocations before doing the smart Right, pointer. right. For, for purposes of getting the most possible performance out of our compilers, we allow them lots and lots of freedom. And one of the freedoms that they have is they can reorder things. And so um, it's possible to call this new, and then this new, and then put this new in this temporary smart pointer, and then this new in this temporary smart pointer. And if that happens and this throws, well, that's no problem. 
But if that happens at this throws, then this guy moved, right? Because he never got put in the smart pointer. And no destructor is going to clean him up. Okay? All right. So what's our rule? How about no more than one new in any state? Well, the problem is it's not really the new that's the problem. I mean, you could do something like this where you have an expression that only has one new, but you might do something else. Um, and uh, we're assuming bar control. Why do we assume bar control? Everything is control. Because we always assume a control unless we know different, right? Um, so, so that rule's not going to really happen. Um, how about never incur a responsibility as part of an expression that controls? Does that sound good? <laughs> it's complicated. Everybody's laughing. Everybody realizes, wait a minute, that's what we do all the time. This is incurring a responsibility to release this, and it could throw. So that rule sounds good, I think, but I don't think does both, not at the same time, but it does do both. Um, so what about this? I don't know if it violates the rule. Is this safe? I mean, we call it F. That could throw. We know that could throw because anything can throw. The food constructor could throw, right? Is this safe? Yes. Yeah, it's safe because um, if anything involved in food uh, throws, then uh, the new uh, operator. So here's the good rule. This is Peter Diamond's rule. What he says is, assign ownership of every resource immediately upon allocation to a named manager object that manages no other resources. Right? So it avoids the probability of, of being temporary, uh, and it's a manager resource. We've talked about that. Everything is going to be, you know, for every resource we get, we're going to have a manager, manager object for. Um, John? Yeah. Back on that last slide. Good. That's a scary wording because you have to be able to really define immediately and it already kind of gets gets nebulous. Would it be better to say, you know, allocate resources in standalone statements so that you don't have the reordering issue? Because what does immediately really mean? In the last example, those two news were happening one immediately after the other, but it wasn't clear from looking at it. I think that's what he means though when he says immediately that it can't be interleaved with any other Operation. I, yeah, that is clearly what he means. I understand yeah. that some people don't understand that things can be done, but that's clearly what he's saying. You've got to make certain that there is no possibility that any other code, particularly code of control, which is basically all code. And, uh, so that. Uh, so in this situation, is this? Well, I said this is safe, right? Uh, it turns out uh, Make Shared has a. Uh, uh, there's a, a standard library version that does forwarding of whatever your initializer data, initializer parameters are. And inside the makeshift, that calls new. So I'm not calling new, it's calling new. And more importantly, even though this is still a temporary, right, this is creating a, a temporary that's going to be returned, but, and it's not named, but because of the forwarding, it's possible within this uh, function for it to make certain that it doesn't throw a new. Okay? Um, by the way, this is make unique is not standard, but her promises it will be. Do um, you know if there's a defect yet? That would be my guess. He's, I mean, he's gone on record as promising that one. Um, so what about this one? Did I just? Oh, 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 the, the difference I had before. Okay, sorry. Okay, so uh, here's a rule. Just don't call new. Um, I'm afraid there's probably people in the audience who aren't going to get away with that. So I would say avoid calling you is, is better. But the lesson learned is to keep your resources on a short lease so they don't go leaking wherever they want. Um, the idea here is, you know, you want your resource managing objects and you want to, res you know, restrict where you're allocating, where you're bringing that responsibility on. So the next thing I want to talk about is that if we're going to be exception safe, we need to treat state, right, in the same way that we treat resources. So let's suppose I'm working in some kind of uh, framework, and it's a, it's a graphic framework, and the, the understanding is that any drawing you do, you return the, the state of the, of the, of the uh, <clears throat> graphic port into the original. So if you want to change the background color, fine, go ahead, but it's your responsibility to restore. Right? And so what we have is a very similar thing to resources. Instead of having some resource that we need to release, we have some state change that we need to restore. Now, of course, not every state change wants to be restored. Sometimes that's the point of what we're doing is we're changing state. 
But there definitely are times when we need to treat state as a resource. Right? So I want to revisit this resource acquisition as initialization and tell you that I don't like this, and it's not just because it's so wordy and doesn't roll off the tongue. I say, I don't like the word resource there. And the reason I don't is because resource includes too much. So think about what resources are. One of the things that's a resource is information. It's a resource, right? So I can call and get the current time. And there's some programs that you really couldn't write if you couldn't get the current time. And there's lots of programs that are a lot better because you can get the current time. It's a real resource. It makes for better programs. But when I get the current time, I don't think to myself, oh, boy, I better restore the current time. <laughs> so getting the current time, I mean, that's a resource. But that's not what they were talking about. So resource includes more than we really want. The other problem is that resource includes too little. And the example is just what I told you. Sometimes we need to manage state as if it's a resource. But state's not a resource, right? The background color is, is not a resource. That's just state. So what I like is the word responsibility. Because that's what we're really talking about. It's not that we got some resource. It's that we acquired the responsibility of releasing the resource. And when we change state, it's we've now acquired the responsibility of restoring the state. So I like this terminology better. I like responsibility acquisition as initialization. And I'd like to talk about responsibility leaks and responsibility management. We'll help <laughs> right. At least it the R. So here's our guideline. Use RAI. Responsibility acquisition is initialization. When you say RAII, you don't have to tell anybody that you're thinking of a better RAII than they are. Just say this and let them think with it. Uh, but the issue is that every responsibility becomes an object. Right? And one responsibility per object. So cleanup code. Don't write cleanup code that isn't being called by a destructor. Destructors must clean up all the object's outstanding responsibilities. Here's the key. Be suspicious of cleanup code that's not called by a destructor. Remember Joel? Some of you weren't here. We read Joel on software. He had a blog posting where he said, you know, if you had code like this, do something and then clean up. He says, most people looking at that, they don't see a problem with that. They think, oh, you're going to do something, you're going to clean it up. And he said, Exceptions are extremely dangerous because do something might throw an exception, either now or maybe sometime in the future, when it's modified. Right? And what did I say? I said, I looked at that and I said, that code's wrong. And I said that when you guys listen to this session, that you would be able to look at it and say the same thing. Do you see why that code's wrong? Yes, sure. You should be suspicious of any cleanup that's not a destructor. Let's fix it. So let's create a cleanup type that does the cleanup in its destructor. Let's put that on the stack, and then we do something. And then if do something returns normally, we clean up. And if it returns with an exception, we clean up. Okay? Exception safe code is exceptionally safe. You can quote. So here's our guideline. All cleanup code is called from a destructor. An object with such a destructor must be put on the stack as soon as calling the cleanup code becomes a responsibility. As soon as we have a responsibility, put it on the stack so that no matter what happens, that responsibility is destroyed. All right, remember Tom Cargo? So he came up with this idea where he said, uh, suppose you have some widget object, and it has a couple of data members, each of which, by the way, has an assignment operator with the strong guarantee. But what he's saying is, is it possible to implement an assignment operator for the widget that also has the strong guarantee? So what's the problem here? Well, the problem is that if you were to update this with a strong guaranteed um, assignment and it throws, well, nothing's touched. That's what the strong guarantee says. So that's it. But if you were to succeed and then you do this one and it succeeds, well, everything's fine. But if this one throws, then what happens? Well, this is untouched. Again, the strong guarantee is saying this is untouched. But what happens? We have partially updated the widget, and therefore we don't have the strong guarantee. So the solution to this is pretty easy. All we need to do is remember what the original T was, and we restore that, right? OK, so we capture the original T1. Then we change uh, T1 by updating it from there. We don't need to check if that throws or not, because it's the strong guarantee. If it throws, there's nothing. And then down here, if this throws, we catch it, and then we restore it, right? Doesn't scale well. 
Well, this can throw. And if this throws, then we're back to the same thing. So all we need to do is now we need to capture the original T1 and the original T2. All right. So here's what Carvel said. Carvel said, you know, exception safety is harder than it looks. It can't be bolted on. We need to think about it from the beginning. We need to put it in the interface. We need to think about how we're going to be exception safe. And his answer was, no, you, you can't do this. You've got, you've got to think about this in advance, how you do it. The thing is, I say we can't. So I'll show you a solution in a little while, and you guys can tell me if I took you on a ride on the uh, Kobayashi Maru or not. <laughs> <laughs> of course I cheated. Of course I cheated. I'm not smarter than Tom Carlisle. If I see something he didn't say, no, it's not going to happen. Of course I'm going to cheat. All right, so let's talk about, okay, we're back in 2003. Now. We're talking about the fundamental object functions. These are the things that are really important. You're doing something. That, it's so important that the compiler will write them for you if you don't. Right? So what is that? Well, construction, both default and copy. The destructor, and then copy assignment if it's a value class. Otherwise, you know, we tend to send it. This brings up the rule of three. How many of you know the rule of three? Okay, that's a pretty good amount. Who can tell us what the rule of three is? That's your rule of three. Okay, well, uh, we don't have this one. But for the copy constructor, uh, for the destructor, and for copy assignment, uh, if you have any one of those, you probably need three. Now, I'm a little, you know, now that we have these nice smart pointers, uh, it's possible that for a copy or an assignment, you may need to do a deep copy. However, destruction comes free because it just cleans up. So I'm already a little down on this, but that's not my biggest complaint about the rule of three. Because even, even in that situation, you could still think of the rule of three as I need to think about all three. Of course, this is still 2003. I think when you get to a, a, a C plus plus 11, there's like the rule of seven or something. Um, but I think even in 2003, there's one more fundamental operator that often gets overlooked. Swap. Swap. You know, the first time I, 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 I coined this here, which is why it hasn't come on when I did it, but I made this up. And the first time I told Howard about it, and you have to understand, this was a long time ago. The first time I told Howard about this, I said, Swap is so fundamental, we should think about it as if it were an operator. That's why I call it swap operator. If you're creating a class, you think about assignment operator, you think about copy constructor, you should think about the swap operator. And Howard, do you remember what he said, Howard? Yeah, I do not remember what it said. What he said is, well, swap's not fundamental. Moves fundamental. <laughs> swap is two moves. Right. Now, the thing is, I'm not sure it's two moves, but I think you know, Howard's trying to optimize this here. But the point is, um, that I think it's, it's really fundamental. So I, I want to have a swap. It's a non-throwing swap. It's a key exception safety tool. Now, swap is defined in the standard, but the swap that's defined in the standard is not no throw. At least, in, remember, we're still in 2003. However, if you think about what swap is doing, um, what are our objects that we create? What are they made up of? Well, a lot of times they're made up of other objects, but what are those other objects made up of? Fundamentally, you get down to these base things. Ints, pointers, doubles. Which of these cannot be swapped without throwing? It turns out that all the fundamental things can be swapped without throwing. So at least in theory, anything should be swappable without throwing. We should be able to make non-throwing swap versions of our objects. Um, and, and even though the standard, there's no way that the standard can look at our objects and say, oh, well, here's what it's made up of, and we can swap this and this and this can't do that. So we're going to make our own swap operator. We're going to call it swap. Even if your naming convention is to use a capital S, stick with the standard and call it swap. Write a one parameter member function and a two parameter free function in the standard namespace. Not the one parameter, but the two span in the standard namespace. If your type is a template, don't put it in the standard namespace. We'll talk about that. Both parameters take, uh, both, both versions take their parameters by non cons reference. Well, that kind of makes sense. If you took it by value, you're not going to be able to swap. Right? And if it's const, you're not going to be able to swap. So it's got to be a non const <coughs> The thing is, make sure it doesn't throw. Um, it, it, but you don't write it like this. Why not? Because we don't ever use dynamic success conditions, right? OK. So now the question is, um, here's an example of how we would do this. So here's our big int class. And we've written a member function that takes a 
non-conch ref to big N, which does the swap. And the way it swaps is, you know, it swaps the bases and it swaps the members. Right? And in the standard namespace, we write a swap that takes two big Ns, again, by non-conch ref. And all it does in our case is just call them in. Now, I just put something in the standard namespace. I'm not on the standard committee. Am I allowed to do that? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, oh, okay. Not in, in 2000. Case, I've got all sorts of plans. Not in 2003. Okay. It turns out that my, I chose my wording very carefully. I said I put something in the standard name space. I didn't say I added something in the standard name space. And that's the key. That I haven't added anything. What I've done is I've specialized a template that was already in the standard name space. And note, I specialized it for a user defined type. It would not be right for me to write a swap of ints. Because anybody out there swapping ints might not like my order. But for my types, I can make a swap, right? So this is a specialization. This is not me adding something to the standard. All right, so here's another example. This time it's a template. So again, I write a member that does this templated uh, thing. It's no throw, but it's not, it doesn't use the set specification. It's just documented to not throw, right? And same thing, swap space. OK, notice now my two member version is not in the standard namespace. <coughs> Why not? I just got through saying that I could, you know, this is swap, right? I can, I can specialize swap, can't I? You can't over that's, ah. that's not a specialization. That's right. This is not a specialization. It looks like a partial specialization, but it's not a specialization. Because partial specialization isn't available to us in C++. So what this is is an overload. And it's legal for me to overload standard things in the standard, but only in my own engine. So that's what we've done. So we create this in our own standard. Right? This causes some interesting things when we want to call it. The question first is, why no throw? Well, it turns out this is the whole point. We could always just call swap. But, again, in 2003, swap is three copies. Copies can fail. Copies can throw. And we want uh, a swap that's no throw. And we know we can write our, our own custom swap to be no throw, assuming we didn't use any non-swapping bases or members, and assuming we didn't use const or ref data members. We can't swap this. So, and remember, this is for uh, uh, value classes. So here's our guideline. Create the swap operator for value classes. Must deliver the no throw guarantee. All right, now, 2011. Howard's better lean forward. Um, so swap operator is new and improved for C++11. And the reason is that standard swap no longer is three copies. Right? It's now what? It's a move construction followed by two move assignments. So it can be no accept if our objects with our move assignments, if our move operators are no accept. <coughs> In other words, we don't need to worry about swap anymore. As long as we have moving operations, for our class that are defined no accept, boom, swap will, in the standard, will do exactly what we want. Right? Now, does that mean we don't want to define swap? Well, I didn't say we don't want to. I said we don't need to. However, for performance reasons, if you were at Howard's talk this morning, you know, there was a question about this, and Dave was pointing out for locality reasons and for other reasons, it might be to in your best interest for performance. Of course, you have a really small class, or something like that, you may not be interested. But you may want to define swap uh, for performance. And if you do define it, make sure it's declared no upset. Because that's what we want, right? Non-throwing uh, swap. So um, then there's these, all these cool rules for when the compiler writes your moves for you. And you know, Howard's talk had that great stuff, which it all makes sense when you see it, but you can't possibly remember. OK, if you, okay, if you define this one, then what doesn't get defined? All these kinds of things. Uh, so how can we be sure that our declarations are done right? Well, one thing you can do is you can call, right? Um, and I could, you know, talk to you about it. We could look at your uh, declarations, and we could. Here's my. <laughs> okay, this isn't going to scale. Um, so how about this? So I've written this function called check swap. It's in my exception safe code namespace. And uh, here's what it here's what it looks like. You just pass a pointer. Of, of a template type to check swap. And uh, I don't even use the value. The value's not important. I'm just getting the type. The only reason there's a parameter at all is so that I can deduce the type uh, if you want to, since it's 
zero. If you're willing to state the type, then you don't have to uh, pass anything because it's, uh, it's defaulted to, I would say null pointer, but you can actually call this in C++ 2003, although it's completely safe to do, but it does not. <coughs> so here's how you might use it. So I create a string, it's a standard string, and I pass the address of standard string. Understand again, this is doing this check entirely at compile time, and it doesn't matter what the value is at all. The only reason we have this type is so that you don't have to write this out, but you could do this if you want. So I want to know, is the standard vector of int, does it properly declare swapping? And it turns out, yes, it does. These things, uh, these things compile, because otherwise it would let us know it compile. Here's how I think you're more likely to use it. Suppose you're declaring your type. Anywhere in any of your members, you just say, oh, check swap on this. And at compile time, it will verify that your declar declarations of your move operations and your destructor and swap all of them. Let's look at how we might do that. So remember, this is inline. So again, absolutely no runtime hit. Because all we have in here is a bunch of static assets. So what do we do? Well, remember we talked about no accept. So no accept takes code, but doesn't execute it. Instead, it sees if it would throw. Well, how could this throw? Well, it could throw if you didn't have a no accept uh, destructor, right? Which we want to have. So if you didn't have that, this would tell you at compile time, bad coder, you need a no accept destructor. And what this one does is, it constructs a T by moving an object of type T, right? And it says, will that throw? And if it does, then you get the appropriate message. I took all the messages out this week. And here, we are doing a move assignment and making certain that move assignment is successful. And then down here, we'll talk about this later, but we check to make certain that I can call swap. And also, it's no accept. So I'll tell you in a minute where the code for this is. You can see it's not a big deal. In fact, you could implement it this way if you wanted. Uh, you could, instead of actually writing the code, you can just call the, uh, treat the um, type traits because there is an is no, no throw move constructible, is no throw assignment. All right? So as you're writing your code, if you have any questions, wow, I got this declaration right, boom. A, a compile time only check, one line. <coughs> All right. Remember we said before, I told you I would talk to you about why we're calling standard swap. Why don't we just say STD swap here? What's wrong with that? Well, you may have put your specialization in there earlier. Uh, um, specialization's not the problem, it's the not overload that's the problem. Uh, oh, oh. If this is a template and we don't know the real type of A and B, and in a template we don't, if these are not templated, if these are just simple my classes, then we put our swap as a specialization in standard and saying std swap would work, no problem. But what if they were templates and we couldn't put them in the standard because we were overloading them? Then if you said std swap, you'd get the standard swap instead of our overload. So how do we deal with, we don't know which. Is it in the standard, is it not in the standard? What we do is we bring standard swap into scope and then we call swap and with Koenig lookup, it will either get the local swap or the standard swap, whichever is appropriate. Yeah? Well, then the question is, why did you bother being very careful putting the first one in the STD namespace? <laughs> because if it's not template code, somebody might say, oh, well, this is not a template, so I can just call STD. And so we want it in there if it's not template code. I mean, if, if you know for certain that your object will always be used properly using this, then no worries. I never have much certainty about how my objects will be used. So I try to be as paramount as possible. So I want to specialize if possible, and specializing should happen in the, in the standard namespace. If I can't, I want to overload. And just hope that people call this way. Of course, if that's too much to remember, you can also do this, and that will do the right thing. Okay? So uh, remember, uh, Create the swap operator for value class. See, that works for 2003. We can't really insist that people create swap operator, right? Because in 2011, I said it's an option. Very often, we want to do it. That's for performance. This is not performance. This is exception safety. So we need to have a different guideline. We can't say create. How about if we say support swap operator for value class, right? Does that work for both? All right. That's our new guideline. 
Um, so you remember we said uh, do not use dynamic exception specifications. I said do use exception specifications. Here's where we want to use it. For cleanup. Of course, destructors are no except by default, so we don't actually have to remember that. That'll just happen for us. But for move and swap, we want to make certain that we've declared those no except. How do we make certain of that? <coughs> we call yeah, we call it the check swap thing. Okay. Where else do we want to put our no except? Well, um, we can put it wherever we can. If we see something that doesn't look like it throws, we can say that. Or we could say uh, wherever it's natural, where it's expected, oh, this probably shouldn't throw. This is me going out on a limb. Maybe I'll feel pretty stupid about having said this a couple years from now. But, but I'm kind of inclined to say no. And here's the reason. Suppose I have some function. It's not move. It's not swap. It's not a destructor. So it doesn't, for exception safety purposes, it doesn't have to be no except. But I look at it and I say, oh, look, there's nothing it's doing that could throw. So I can say no except. The problem is I'm with Joel on this one. I can't look in my crystal ball and make certain that sometime down the road somebody doesn't modify. Of course, it's their responsibility if they add something that throws to take the no except off. But if they forget to do that, it's not going to get called to compile time. In fact, a lot of testing might happen where it doesn't happen. But in that one time when that exception is thrown on some, you know, client situation or in the worst possible time, if you're an Amazon guy, that would be, you know, three days before Christmas. That exception may happen. And, uh, okay, so maybe it's true that no except gives you so much cool optimizations that we should put it everywhere we can. I'm a little more conservative, and I'm saying, if I don't need it, I think I'm going to let it go. Yeah. Why, why don't they get compiler checks on no exceptions? We talked about that um, a lot in the last session, so watch the video. Um, the problem is this. So vector has a member function called at. At will throw, right? And it will throw if the, if the index you pass to it is out of range for the vector. However, if you always check the size before you call, you can be absolutely certain so that it will never talking about that, yeah. It's the same issue, right? It's possible that you could call a function that might throw, but you could be confident that the way you're calling it doesn't. And the compiler won't second guess you. And that's why. OK, so we're going to talk about the critical line. The critical line is for when you implement the strong guarantee. The point that Dave made earlier today I think is really important, and that is that we don't want to implement the strong guarantee there's any cost. Now, the interesting thing about the strong guarantee is implementing the basic guarantee very often gives us the strong guarantee for free. In other words, the, the, the natural implementation of being exception safe at all is gives you a transactional result, gives you the strong guarantee. If you are saying, oh, but the strong guarantee is so much nice, you know, I can give it to my <coughs> users of my types, they don't want it if it costs extra, right? And the truth is, as Dave also pointed out this morning, it's quite possible. Suppose, for example, I want to insert something in the middle of a vector, right? Well, what's that going to do? Um, well, it, it's going to cause things that might. It's not going to get guaranteed to be uh, exception safe. In fact, it's you're not necessarily certain what the state of the world's going to be if it does. Them. It doesn't have a strong guarantee. However, could we implement that with a strong guarantee? Sure. All we have to do is copy the vector, do the insert. As long as nothing through, then we do a swap. And the thing is, I don't have to be the implementer of vector to do that. I can do that as just a client. So the strong guarantee is here for times when it is natural. Um, but we shouldn't be knocking ourselves out to implement the strong guarantee. It turns out in practice, that's not always what we want. It, it's, it's, it's expensive to, to get. What we want is absolute robustness in the face of error. But the strong guarantee is nice to have when we can get it, but we don't really want to pay extra for it unless we don't need it. But let's talk about how we do it if we're going to do it. So here's an example. This is a uh, assignment operator. We always talk about assignment operators. Right? So here's an assignment operator. And it, uh, it's for an object that owns some kind of resource and is going to be responsible for cleaning that, right? So what do we do? We delete the resource. Then we create a new resource using the copy constructor on the right-hand side resource. And then we return this, right? 
What's the problem? Yeah. Okay. Um, one thing we could do that uh, the earlier code that we talked about, we could add uh, an assignment, uh, self-assignment check. But we have the problem that you said, yes, if, if this throws, it's too late, we've already killed this. Um, it would be particularly bad if this threw, uh, if we deleted and then we weren't doing self-assignment because we just deleted this and then we tried to copy it. That would be pretty bad. All right, so let's try to do this a little bit better. And this time, what we're gonna do is we're going to create a temporary version of this, uh, this resource that we manage by getting in the right-hand side and making it temporary, and then we do our swap, right? And what do we know about this swap? It doesn't grow. Since it's our code, we made sure it didn't grow, right? So we swap that resource, and now this is the only part to control. If this throws, notice we haven't modified anything in this. We haven't modified this guy here or anything else. So is this a strong guarantee? Okay, it turns out that we don't need self-assignment anymore. Notice, if this was a self-assignment, what would we be doing? Well, we'd make a copy of our own resource and then we'd swap our own resource. Well, that's a waste of time, so it's not very efficient for the self-assignment, but it turns out self-assignment's not very common, so it's probably not what we want to optimize. So just taking out the self-assignment check is probably the optimal way to do it, because now we're optimizing for non-self-assignment. And one of the things that uh, Herb pointed out is, uh, if you, if you need self-assignment, you're probably not exceptions. I've definitely seen classes where that's not true, but that's certainly something to look at. If you, if you see self-assignment somewhere, look at that assignment operator very carefully. It's possible that there's issues. All right, so now let's talk about what I was talking about earlier, the critical one. And the idea is that we want the strong guarantee. So we call all the code that might fail. And then, and only then, do we start calling code that can't fail, and we use it to update our objects, right? So in other words, what was it we were trying to do? We were trying to say that if any exception happens, nothing's touched. Well, guess what? If anything happens, we haven't done anything that touches anything. We only start touching things, we only modify this, after we've done all of code that can fail. And that's why we call it the critical one. It separates the code that uh, that can fail from the code that does the modification. <coughs> All right, so let's. I would say threading and doing it a lot. People can do it best. Yeah. You do all your stuff. Just lock down there. Or if you can get that box so small, just write it off three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Else oh, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So what he's saying is if. If you need to lock something, you want the lock window to be as small as possible. So do as much updating, copying everything out outside the lock, then lock and do whatever needs to be done in an unlock. Make it as small as possible. So that's what you're saying. Yeah. Right, okay, right. Because you only have one chance to you only update one thing basically. Right. Public Okay, so let's go back and look at the code that we just looked at. This is the same code we were looking at, except I added the critical one. Right? Now, it's possible that the code is written like this. All I've done here is made the, the resource that we created, the copy gets created as a temporary. So this is effectively the same code, it's just that this copy is not on the stack, doesn't have a name, but, but it's still safe to do the swap, and it's still, this is created entirely before swapping happens. So if this failed and threw the swap in there, right? So the problem with it, the only problem with it is that you can't draw the critical line because it's right about there. But it's still logically there. Uh, boy, okay. Nate? Well, I mean, didn't you tell us to write the swap operator with a non cuts reference? You've got a temporary. <laughs> um, Is that what your question was? What, what no, was I was just going to say if you're going to take it a step further and just pass the uh, <clears throat> right hand side by value to start with so you don't have to do that anyway. Right, okay, we'll talk about it. James, did you have a question? Oh, the same thing. Okay. So, um, ah, there it is. Yeah, so this is, this is that version. 
we're going to take the, the instead of just instead of just duplicating this, we're going to take this whole thing by copy and then do the swap on the whole thing. And this has the advantage that the compiler can rely on the copy for. Um, okay. So the thing is, if we step into into uh, uh, this works for 2003, but if we step into here, then when we want to talk about moves, and remember this is going to be our no except move, now we have uh, an issue. And the issue is that this is ambiguous. A resource owner taken by value is going to be oh. ambiguous with a resource owner taken by <coughs> you know, our value reference. Right? So for 2011, we probably don't want to do that. We probably want to do go back to doing this. And so, um, so we can do something, something like this with our moves. All right. So the guideline is use the critical line for the storm data when you want to do the storm data. Now I want to revisit Cardo. Remember what the problem was with Cardo? <coughs> we had two, uh, we had a, a widget with two datas that we want to make a strong, strong assignment operator. On. And so, this I think this one, right? The cheating is that I'm making the assumption that I have swap operator tokens. Right? I make some temporaries and then I swap it. And so this gives us a strong guarantee for an object that has two data members each of the on there too. Notice it has the code. Right? I did the things it could throw, and then I did things that I All right. So where do we want to try to catch? So if we're going to be complete, we need to think about this. And it turns out, as I said, uh, we, uh, we need to think about where it is that we absolutely need to have the trust. We've been writing code that uh, is, is dealing with the intermediate. How do we make it safe even if an exception is thrown? But now we're talking about, well, where does that handling have to happen? So I have uh, three areas where I think we need to do the, the, the tries. The first is called switch. And this is anywhere we need to switch our method of error. Right? So I'm a firm believer we should be using exceptions, but can use exceptions everywhere. Where? Well, there are places where we have to support the no-throw guarantee. So, for example, in destructors, we may need to put a try in a destructor if we're calling something that might. Uh, swap operator move might have the same situation. If we uh, are supporting a C API, then we need to make certain that we aren't going to leak any exceptions. Uh, we may have OS callbacks. Uh, it turns out that the user can't take an exception thrown in their face. We're actually going to have to stop the exception and, and translate it into something else. So that's what I'm calling switch. Right? Uh, we may have to convert to other exception types. It's possible that we've defined an API and we've said, by the way, all our exceptions are going are to derive from standard except. And it turns out that we're calling a library that otherwise is exception safe, but they throw different exceptions. So we may need to catch them just to, just to switch our error report. Right? And of course, then we also have threats where we can't throw across. Them, right? So there are certain times when you just absolutely need to put a try catch because you can't can't leak exceptions. The other one is what I call strategy. So this is any place where we have a fallback. We have a strategy of dealing with fit. So let's suppose I've got some kind of application. When the user logs in, I go to some server and I download the user's preferences. Okay? Now the problem is that may fail. I may not be able to get the server, may not be up, there may be traffic issues, whatever the deal is, user may be remote, whatever. So I may not be able to get the user's preferences. So I have a backup plan, and the backup plan is I'm going to use the preferences that they used on this client last time. I cached it. Right? So in that situation, I didn't fail the command. The command was go get the user's preferences. So what happens is at some low level, I'm going to get an exception thrown saying, hey, I can't do what you asked. But at some point, I understand there's a backup plan. At that point, I put a, a, a catch in there and say, by the way, if this fails, then let's look and see if we've cached results from before. Uh, if not, maybe we do need to throw, but otherwise we can use it. So that's what strategy is. You have some fallback plan. And then the last thing is some success. 
don't know how often this is going to happen, but there are times when you may have to do a lot of something, and some failures don't mean you've completely failed. Usually that's exactly what it means, right? You say, oh, I want to print this document. Well, what do we need? Okay, well, we need to find the printer. We may need to spool something. We need to find the server, whatever we need. If any one of those things doesn't work, we're not going to print. So usually some failure is, is catastrophic. But there are times when you might do something where there could be some failure. So here's an example that I actually got in my real world situation. So here's a situation where you call the database with some record ID. And uh, in this case, I want to get a contact. And I'm going to open the contact with uh, the contact that, uh, or create a contact window. And then I'm going to load the contact data from the database. If this were to throw, then uh, I can't open the window. And that's the correct thing. Yeah. Put up a, an alert saying, oh, I can't show. But suppose I want to use the same function for getting a, a record. But in this case, what I'm doing is I'm scavenging the database. In other words, the user thinks that they've had some corruption. So what are we going to do? We are going to make a new database, copying each record one at a time, because we think that some records may be correct. If that's the case, what are we going to do? We're going to put this in a loop, in a try, where we try to read a record. And maybe if we can't read it, we log it or something like that. But a single failure doesn't avoid it. Right? We, ex we are willing to have some success. So that's our guideline of where we want to put the trust. Any place where we need to switch our error reporting, any place where we have a backup strategy for what to do in case of failure, and any place where failure, any first sign of failure is not catastrophic. In none of those places you want to put the trust. So now I want to talk about the most important design guide. So everyone knows who Scott Myers is because he's known for his C++ design, uh, advice. But this most important design guideline, he says this is a universal design principle. And I've never heard anybody who, who he said this to who said, oh, I think it's crazy. Right? Anybody know what Scott Myers' universal design principle is? Yeah. Inter interfaces should be easy to use correctly and hard to use incorrectly. Wow. That was almost word for word. And I had to type from Make interfaces easy to use correctly and hard to use. Yeah. I don't know what a good example that is, but I can't imagine how you're going to use a more impressive form. So that was my thing. But anyway, so that has nothing to do with C++. It has to do with physical objects. It has to do with any kind of software. It has to do with, you know, that's, that's not a C++. All he's saying is make certain that it's easy to do right and hard to do wrong. Anybody want to disagree with that? All right, so let's apply that to exceptions. Suppose we have some call where we return an error code, and a different call, although it has the same name, it's just um, a different call, and it throws. And if our definition of using it right is that we handle the error, and our definition of using it wrong is that we ignore the error, which one of these is easy to use right and hard to use wrong? Second. Second. <laughs> Second. All right, there's always one. Okay, so the guideline is prefer exception codes to error codes. Right? Because if we know how to write things safely, which we do now, by following all the other guidelines, then let's use that, let's leverage that. Let's make certain that our errors never get dropped in the floor. We never ignore those. So, um, yeah, throwing exceptions should mostly be about resource availability. So, when it's possible, we want to provide. Uh, strong preconditions instead of looking at failure cases. Uh, and, uh, and we don't want to be using exceptions for flow control. If you're in a tight loop and you're hitting exceptions every time through the loop, you've probably got other issues you need to do. By the way, I, I didn't put credit on here. This came from somebody who's actually quite generous with giving credit. Right, Sean? <laughs> Sorry about that. No credit for Sean. Um, so here are the design guidelines. I told you they fit on one slide. Um, some of you weren't here for the first part, so you didn't get to see them all. But the first one is throw by value, catch by reference. Then no dynamic exception specifications, but use no exception. Destructors that throw are evil. Use RAII. Every responsibility is an object, one per. All cleanup code called from a destructor. <coughs> Support the swap operator, always with a no throw guarantee. Draw critical lines for the strong guarantee. Nowhere to catch, switch, strategy, some success, and prefer exceptions to error. What's that? Error. 
Yeah. yeah, you have an error in your error code line. Oh, two, two. Oh. <laughs> well, something I'll have to do later. Doing it um, later. So let's talk about some implementation for um, It's just there. So one of the things that I said is all cleanup code is in a destructor. So that implies that we're going to create a type whose destructor is going to call the cleanup code. And for most of the kinds of things we do, if we're going to do something a lot, we're going to use it a lot, it makes sense, we'll make that custom type. But sometimes you might do some one-off cleanup and, and making that is, is kind of tedious. So that's why we have this, um, uh, this thing called onscope exit. And what onscope exit does is it takes, a, uh, it takes a function that we want to call, a function pointer that we want to call when we go on, on scope exit. That's what we want to call it. So in this case, this is some UI code, and uh, we drag, uh, we're going to uh, drag the cursor, and it's, uh, it's going to be a grab hand while we drag it. But if we, whether we in by exception or not, we need to absolutely make certain we have a responsibility to reset this back to the open hand. So on scope exit is going to call that function. Of course, one of the nice things about the function is it doesn't take any parameters. So we might have uh, something here, and almost certainly uh, this is Mac programming kind of stuff. New handler, you would have some new handler object, but I wanted to uh, show off my uh, on scope exit. So uh, I've made this static, or excuse me, a local object, which is a handle disposer, and it binds uh, dispose handle to new handle. And the idea is you could actually call release if you didn't want to dispose it, but, but in most cases you have a responsibility to clean it up. So uh, we want to clean John? Yeah. So does C11 not have any? Equivalent of a scope guard like this? Um, I don't think so. I think that there there are plenty of others. I'm not saying this is. I mean, I like this one, but well, sure. But, I've, but there's all sorts of scope guards. Can't yeah. share pointer in 2011 be used to do exactly that? Yeah, because you have custom deleters, you can do some cool stuff. You need but, a better. But then you have to have the deleter. And you have to write. The idea was, I don't want to write any code. I just want to. I just want to tell it. Oh, here calls. So, John. Yeah. Yeah, you know. I was going to say, if you want to use this with a, with a, a smart pointer, use a unique pointer, because at least you won't get an allocation into the cover when you construct a unique pointer. Did you hear what you yeah. All right, cool. so I want to go back and, and look at Joel. Remember, our do something in our cleanup. But before, I said, well, let's suppose there's some cleanup type. But we don't really need a cleanup type. We could just say, oh, here's a, by the way, this is a, here's a lambda that's going to call cleanup for us. So C11 needs to be cleaned. Um, uh, well, because clean was a function, so it takes a function for it. That's true. Uh, okay. Uh, so here's the implementation. Uh, this is in my uh, uh, code. You can get this code off later. Um, I do have one thing that I, I point. This is just, I, I like this, even though it's probably not all that useful. But the idea is that um, I have this thing called revert value. And what you do is you give it some object uh, that's going to be in scope that you want to, instead of calling a function, you just need to change this value. So there's some inside this memory, or inside this memory function. If we do things, it sends notifications, and we want to temporarily turn that off. We're going to say set notifications as false. But we need to restore it to whatever it was. It was already false when we went minute false. Otherwise, we want to set up to it. And so I have this thing called uh, revert value. And the cool thing to me is just that it's a template, so it takes the type, but it also takes the address because it has to restore, and it takes the value. So it takes type and address and value of this. I thought it was fun. Um, so, uh, oh, this is actually uh, yeah, part, of the, uh, part of the implementation. Of the um, so if you go to my exception safe code uh, website and, uh, and uh, uh, look there, there's check swap and uh, scope exit is all in the same, it's all in the same code. Very small file. You can download that file. Do as you wish. So I want to talk about Lippincott functions. Um, I named this after somebody who taught me how to do Lisa Lippincott. She was very careful to tell me, no, I didn't actually <coughs> do it, but I always call them Lippincott functions. And I was really surprised to see, even though it has nothing to do with C11, that the new C standard library, uh, the second edition, which is the 2011 edition, actually has an example of this, um, very right close to the front of the book. But here's an example, and this is kind of a cut down thing of something that I actually had to work on. I had a, a C API uh, that I supported that was something on the order of 1,500 calls. But it was implemented in C++, but the API was in C. 
Um, and so we, we had this boilerplate kind of thing where we would be able to call any of our C++ code, but we had to catch, and we had all these different libraries that might throw different kinds of things, and basically we were just trying to convert whatever the exception was into something that was a result code that we could return in a C API, right? Um, and of course, if you ever added a new library or changed any of this, you only had to change it 1,500 times. So it seems like there ought to be a better way. And it turns out there is. What you do is, all that catch goes away, and you just say catch all, and then you call error from exception. How does it figure out what the error from exception is? Well, it looks a little mysterious, but actually it's pretty cool. When you call error from exception, the first thing it does is it just rethrows. Now, notice, if anybody calls error from exception when they're not inside a catch handler, bad things will happen. This is going to terminate the app. And I tried and tried, and I couldn't figure out. I haven't tried with, with C++11. Maybe there's a way. I'm not certain how to prevent this from happening. Um, maybe, uh, maybe with C++11, you can call current exception and see if you've got something in the pointer. That might work. But it was dangerous before, but I always made sure I'm only calling it from within a catch. But if it does, you rethrow, and then you just put the catches, the same catches we saw before, um, and get the error. And but the point is that you can call this function in the catch handler of all of those 1,500 functions. And if you ever need to change it, you change it in one place, and it works in all 1,500 places. Yeah? Um, you can actually do it with even less repetitive code. You don't even need to try and catch in each of the functions. If you have this take a lambda, and have it call that, you know, have all your function body in the lambda and have yeah. this call it inside the try block. Yeah. A nice 2011 two solution. <coughs> I need a catch all. <laughs> a catch all macro. That, yeah. that way you know that you want to find this yeah. I need it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I actually use that, that, that technique and like a little test framework using lambda. I pass in the code I want to test and like if I'm expecting Okay, so I did want to talk about boost exception. Um, the thing that's interesting to me about boost exception is it's designed to uh, add enhanced troubleshooting. In other words, what we've been talking about in both these sessions is we we throw at the bottom, we catch at the top, and we basically don't need to worry about the exceptions it goes through as long as we write code in such a way that we aren't leaking or uh, otherwise losing our responsibility. Right? Um, but sometimes you might want to catch an exception to give it more context. So for example, um, you might have a low level uh, function that's trying to read from a file. And it might be passed a file pointer. And if it can't read from the file for some reason, uh, then it might want to throw an exception. But the problem is, what would you like to know if you knew that something failed while reading a file? What's the logical information you'd like to know? The name of the file. But the, but the, but the function that's throwing it doesn't have the name of the file. It has a file pointer. And it could give you the file pointer. It could say, oh, well, this is at location A7. That's not going to help you very much, right? So what you can do is, you can actually use boost exception. It has a way of adding information. There's a whole protocol. I won't go into all that. But you add information to the exception as you can put up a, a try at a point, and you can say, oh, by the way, this is what I was doing. Any boost exception that comes through, I can add and say, this is what I was doing at this point. So at the low level, you could say, oh, um, I had a problem trying to reach the end of file. Read it. At a higher level, you catch that and say, oh, the file that he was trying to read was this file. At a higher level, you say, the reason I'm trying to read a file is because I need to school for printing. And at a higher level, you say, well, I'm trying to print this document. And so for troubleshooting purposes, that's what it's for. You can find out you know, all this information, which is not known at any one place. Right? At the high level, you don't know that it was a read error. And you don't even know the file anymore. And at the middle layer, where you might know, oh, here's the file, but you don't know what the read error was, and you don't know why you were trying to do anything. So that's the idea of an interest exception. Um, when is that going to be standard? <laughs> um, as soon as you get it ready for proposal. You need to go to, to uh, Beeman's, uh, Beeman's talk about who's defining it. OK. So I want to talk about, and I promised you this, that I'm going to talk about, we know how to do exception-safe code now. 
And in our perfect world where all our code is move safe and, and swap safe and all these kinds of things, but now we step out of the you know, world of the future into the world of the past with our legacy code, and here we see code that just does not handle code path gracefully. Right? How do we transition that legacy code into the code we'd like to be working with? And this is where we get Sean Parent's iron law of legacy refactoring. Existing contracts cannot be broken. Okay. So let's talk about what that really means. So here's the rule. The first rule is all new code is written to be exception set. How do we do that? Well, we just looked at nine rules. If you follow those nine rules, you'll be exception set. Right? Um, any new interfaces are free to throw an exception. Except what? Well, not moving or swapping or throwing. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying, you know, we have new functionality that we're going to do. That will throw, or we assume it will throw, unless we document it otherwise. But when you're working on existing code, the interface to that code must be followed. If it wasn't throwing exceptions before, it can't start. That's the iron law of upholding the existing code. Right? So here's the, here's the hint about how we're actually going to do this. So I'm working on some existing function, and I'd like it to be exception safe, but I know the callers of this are not expecting to have throws, and I can have all sorts of things. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to make a parallel implementation. So I'm going to copy all this existing code out of the old legacy and put it in a new code. And I can do refactor that as needed to be exception safe. And then I will have the old code now call the new code, but wrap it in a project, right? Using our switch saying we can't report errors in this. So here's the refactoring steps um, based on following this, right? So we're going to implement a parallel call following the exception safety guidelines. The legacy call now calls the new, uh, new function wrapped in this try class. Remember, the legacy API is unchanged and doesn't throw, assuming it didn't throw initially. Um, the new code can always safely call through <coughs> throwing code. And that's the world you want to be in. You want to where? <coughs> Always. Okay. Always safely. Always safely. Read it really fast. <laughs> All right? And then, as appropriate, you retire the wrapper functions. Have you ever actually done this, John? Yeah. <laughs> and it worked. How long does it take to get rid of all the crap? where you say, well, that was good code yesterday, but we're starting all over. Yeah, I want that. Uh, um, I don't quite understand. Is the was the legacy code exception safe? No. Well, if it wasn't exception safe, then why is it important to maintain the non-exception non safe contract? Because people are calling, yes. But, it, but presumably, your code was going to throw it. you have is you have people on your team or your manager who says you're not introducing exceptions to our code base because we know of instances where bad things are going to happen. And so you have to have a set of steps where you can proceed with confidence. So well, these are the steps. So unless, what we're, unless it's a C API that we're talking about, I mean, that's, well, false, that's, that's, that's a false justification because if you're calling you know, normal, you know, un unadulterated new, well, you, but know, we can't assume that, I mean, it's, it's quite possible people new. have now throughout their new. Well, sure. And, sure. and if that's the case, but then they know they don't have to. But that's probably the exception rather than the rule. Well, not necessarily. 
And in fact, you may have situations where people have, have disabled exceptions. And, you need to, and so they've been confident that you're calling you to drugs. And so now we need to Although I, I have run into people who, who swear up and down to me that, you know, you know we, we, don't, we don't have exceptions anywhere. You use Vector, don't you? I don't think, I think. Well, well, that's people don't understand what, what, what problems they already have. That's yes. quite possible, but they're afraid of adding new ones. And so this is a way that you can proceed with confidence. So uh, one of the things that I like about this is that even though it's still a big job to do a several million line application, you can do it in small bites. You, you, you just, as you regularly maintain, whether you're adding features or you're fixing bugs, whichever, when you touch a function, you fix that function. You don't need to swallow the elephant. There is no situation where you need to go to your manager and say, okay, no forward progress is going to happen for the next month because we have to fix a whole bunch of exception safe code all at once. It doesn't happen that way. You can do it in little bits. And you can have confidence because your code base is never at risk. Or more, more, more precisely, you are not adding risk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. So, um, I wanted to show you an example of before and after. And so I swear to you, I'm a Mac guy, so I went to Apple's, uh, Apple's website, and, and they have all sorts of sample code and document things. And the first piece of code I found was in their FS create file, an open port Unicode sample code, and uh, in, in a call called create read only for current user. And what it is, it, it calls um, uh, MBR underscore and ACL underscore APIs, and the way they work is they return non-zero codes for them. So I took that, that code. I want you all to read the code. <laughs> OK. It's not so important that you read the code. All that's important is you know the shape. So basically, every time, this is their code. Every time they call something, they do an if. And if it's, uh, if it's equal to zero, then they know it's safe. And so they do something else. And so you see the if, right? And then here's all the ifs unwinding. And then if the ACL um, uh, needs to be free, then we they set a flag if they do free the ACL, they free the ACL, and then they return the ACL if, uh, if, okay. So you get the idea, right? Yeah? You know, Apple has some really nice macros that uh, help with this. Well, they may have, but they didn't put on the sample. They all require, they were in an issue of develop, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I rewrote the code. Now, here's the assumptions I made. Let's assume, and this isn't true, but let's assume that the MBR and the ACL APIs now throw. Now, Apple did not change their implementation, and I did not rewrite these. This is just an exercise to show before and after. So we'll assume that these don't throw. Now, we also, because they're using this ACL that needs to be released, and because there's a responsibility associated with that, that I've created this RAII wrapper class. Okay? So with those assumptions, let's, uh, let's rewrite. And uh, so there's a couple things I did. The first one is I wrote an intermediary version. And the idea is that it also doesn't throw. It reports error in exactly the same way the existing code does. But I said, eventually, the rest of my code base will be safe, and I can actually throw instead of returning the error. So I actually have two flavors. I have the intermediate flavor, which is exception safe within the function. And then I have after flavor, which assumes that I'm in a, in a that I can throw, that I'm in an exception safe. So let's take a look at the first rewrite. Right? Again, you probably aren't going to be able to read it. But you'll notice that it's a little bigger, and the reason it's a little bigger is because I got rid of all the tries, or excuse me, I got rid of all the ifs. But you notice there is a try and a catch here because I can't throw an exception out of my function. So let's rewrite it one more time uh, where we will report using exception. So this is the after version, right? This is the after version. Wow. Um, Notice there, before, there was one if for every call to every one of these. Now, it's straight. Um, so let's look at what we got here. Um, actually, I don't know if you noticed that, but I actually inserted some blank lines. They didn't really need it because they had these if braces. Over there. So I inserted some blank lines. And even so, I had only half as many lines. I had no braces other than the function itself when I was able to, this is with the after, so I didn't even have the try line. I got rid of all of the braces and all of the control structures. Now, I'm not going to promise you you'll always get rid of all your control structures. This is just the example I got. So my argument is that this is easier to write and read. And guess what? Without picking all that ifs, right, the, the success path has no ifs. 
the success path just does what it needs to do. And it's robust. So what does exception safe code look like? There is no truck. Well, Yoda's kind of over speaking here. <laughs> what it looks like, though, is it's the coder's fantasy. What is your fantasy regarding errors? It's that you can just ignore them, right? Wouldn't that be cool if every time you call something, you don't have to worry about, OK, yeah, well, if it fails, then I have to do it. No, no. Now, it's true, we're not actually, this is what the fantasy would be. We're not really there, because yes, we do have <coughs> error detection and we have error handling, but the code, the bulk of the code between here and here, what does it look like? Well, it looks very much like the coder's fantasy. Right? All we worry about is the success path. The power of the exception safe coding is, if you follow these guidelines, you're focusing on the success path. Remember this? This is what I just showed you. But notice, it's just one statement after another. There's no ifs, there's no concern. If I told you, oh, just ignore the exceptions and rewrite the code, I mean, rewrite, ignore the errors and rewrite their code, this is what your code would look like, right? Now, I did add you know, this magical uh, new type I had to create, which, uh, um, which throws when, it, when, when there's an error, or I mean, it cleans up, cleans up if there's an error. But other than that, all I did was rewrite their code, ripping out all the ifs. Okay. So the promise I made, you guys in the second session didn't hear the promise, but my promise was that if you follow these steps, your code will be easier to read and understand, easier to write, no time penalty, and 100% robust in the face of exceptions. So let's talk about that. Why is it easier to read and write? Well, many fewer lines of code. Uh, no code for handling error, at least the main part of the code, yes, again, there is error detection and there is error handling at the top and the bottom, but the main part of the code does not do any propagation at all. We focus on the success path. How much clearer would your code be if when I read your code, all I worried about was the success path? So why no time penalty? Well, we did talk about a few of the caveats I had to have about no time penalty. But in the code we had there, assuming it's not on Visual, uh, Visual Studio, uh, 32, um, there is no time penalty for the success path. And on top of that, we are not even doing the if coding that it was checking. You know, in the old code, even in the success path, every time they had to say if. If this, then do this. If this, then do this. Maybe the compiler is smart enough to figure out which is the likely path and that's the one you want to optimize, but maybe it's not. It's just an if. It doesn't know. Well, which one do we optimize for? Uh, and in my case, the compiler is going to know where the error handling code is because it's the catch blocks that can be, we know that doesn't have to be fast. Right? So the compiler can take that into consideration. Why is it 100% robust? It's because errors are not ignored. Right? And because we don't have any invariance violated because of the exception safe guidelines. We, have. we don't have leaks. So I want to thank you. The website, again, is exceptionkcode.com. If you want to send me a nice review and see your name on that website, um, send it. If you want to see a mean review, I promise, as long as it's clean, I'll put it there. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at Jonathan Kell. And if you want to work at a company that uh, takes C++ very seriously, please send me your resume at e9.com. Yeah. Um, 
you listed the types you could catch, so I was wondering if you could catch an R value type that seems to be explicitly forbidden by the standards, and TCC happily ignores that. Do you I'm know? Sorry, I, I didn't hear what you said. Um, you listed all the types you could catch, uh -huh. and thus I was wondering whether you could catch R value uh, references. Catch R value references? Yeah. Now, the standard explicitly forbids it, it turns out. Howard, I need you. But why? Except can you can you catch by R value reference? I don't think you can because it's going to be uh how it's gonna to try to bind to it's gonna have an L value argument for that that mesh box. Did you hear what he said? No, you can't. He said that the exception itself is an L value. Right. And so it's an L value <coughs> argument. It's not gonna to bind to an R value. Otherwise right. you'd be stealing from the pending exception. Those exceptions are just too much. And the pending exception lives in a weird place. Um, and it might get really wrong. And if you read through it, when you have swipe, it's guts. Well, yeah, that's, I mean, that's your, yeah. It's a good reason not to do that. Right. Um, I've never finished a session on time in my life, so you guys better ask some questions, because we've got two minutes left. Yeah, Chuck. I was wondering if, um, there are any idioms for er on error instead of on exit. <clears throat> for example, let's suppose I have a, uh, uh, a bit of code where I've got, let's say, a couple of steps inside, and I want the strong guarantee, so therefore I have to back them out as a transaction. In D, you can just say scope, failure, run this function, and then a little bit later you can say scope, failure, run this other function, and they automatically get run in last in, first out order if an exception is thrown. And even if the exception is thrown in between them, only the one that has been registered gets um, uh, executed for cleanup. So instead of just on scope exit, which is a very nice feature, on error. And so I'm wondering if there's, uh, it, uh, if there's anything in the standard or if there's any good idioms for that. Looks I like. Kind of, I, yeah, we'll talk about, I mean, the thing that, it sounds like to me that you're trying to revert things. And in general, that doesn't seem to me like a, like a successful strategy for strong guarantee. Well, it's a rollback of a transaction. To not do anything at all. And then if you know you're going to not fail, if you're below the critical line, then swap, then swap over. You don't probably want to revert things back because that's not likely to be happening. Mm. So, did you have time? Well, it's, it seems to me that you might be able to get where you want to go using a uh, standard uncaught exception. You have an object that in your destructor you see if you have a, an in-flight exception and say, oh, I guess I need to do some reverting. Like, oh, that was my next question, is if uncaught exception is still in the standard. Our? Yes. 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 Yeah. We don't take anything out of the standard. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so I don't know how, how, how successful that would be, but certainly that would be where I would start. It's well, you know, the, the problem with uncut exception. I know there were papers to fix this for C++ 11, but I don't know if it's doing it. The problem with uncut exception is it doesn't tell you if your current destructor is being unwound because of an exception. It just means that there's an exception that's uncut somewhere in the system. And to give you an idea of how that can happen, I could have Okay, well, I get the gist of your answer. I, I remember Lisa Lippincott trying to do all sorts of things with a kind of section, just could not make it. Yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. yeah. I never saw it. So useful. I don't, were you? Something else that might apply to what he's trying to do is often with the guardian of is um, adding dismiss and recall member functions. So the idea is that the guard by default is going to take an action in the destructor, but if you dismiss it, then you're saying don't do it in the destructor, and then recall says, oh, on second thought, do it, you know, that kind of a thing. But so you can have it by default do something in its destructor, choose to dismiss it when things go right, say, but you know, if you invert that, that notion, it might fit what he's trying to do. Yeah, yeah and your, uh, your little ACL uh, 
object had that in there. I know it had a release yeah. at the end. So it was going to, basically, right. in the destructor, it, it was going to restore it, restore what it was before, unless you call it release, in which case it just did not. Right. It just tends to get a little hairy when you got, say, two or three steps in there or something like yes. that. You know, one of the things I didn't talk about with the, with the critical, uh, the critical line actually makes a lot of sense to think about even in multiple lines. So in other words, you might do some things that can fail and then do your updates. And then once you're back to that nice stable system, then you can do more things that can fail and, and go back to updates. You will not get the strong guarantee, but you can write safe code, right? Where you're alternating. You're either in a mode where you're modifying things or you're in a mode where you're doing things that can fail and you don't mix those. And so if you do them kind of in stripes, you do, you know, do a bunch of temporary stuff that, can, that could possibly fail and you're doing it on temporaries, then you update in ways that can't fail. Then you do some more. It won't give you the strong guarantee because once you started modifying, if you throw down here. But again, I want to emphasize the strong guarantee is not the goal. Strong guarantee is nice when you can get it free, but it's not the goal. Yeah. I just want to respond to that comment. It could get hairy two or three steps in. I mean, it seems to me that the way to deal with that is to declare your responsibility and your responsibility manager as you require the responsibility. You can name that for your steps. You, but then you'd have to kind of have the nested scopes in there. But that I, I see how I see what you're saying. I, I'm talking about the same scope. You, you, you only need to clear the manager at the point when you acquire the responsibility. And then oh. All of them will get destroyed in your scope, however you believe it. And you know, once you're successful, okay, you call your releases. Gotcha. Is the order determined that? We are. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. One of the one of the favorite things about C plus plus is. Order of destruction is absolutely uh, right. Absolutely determined. So we are past the time. If you guys want to come up and ask me questions, I might stick around. I might not. I don't know. But uh, I really want to thank you guys. You've been a, been a great you been a great. Sean, you've answered great questions. I want to thank you guys. For